Today we are going to discuss about how a nephron works, right? How in the kidney urine is formed. Is that right? All of you know that kidney basically has special types of tubes which are called nephrons, right? And these tubes are involved in formation of urine. And in one kidney, how many nephrons are there? Yes, Mr. Abbas. In one kidney, how many nephrons are there? Yeah? One million. And in about 1 to 1.2 million, right, in one kidney. It means in both kidneys, you have uh, 2 to 2.4 million nephrons. And every nephron has a glomerulus, which is a filtering unit, which is a filtration unit. Our main discussion today will be about the structure and function of glomerulus. What is glomerulus? Glomerulus is mainly the filtration unit for a nephron. As you know, we have about 2.4 million nephrons in both kidneys. It means we should have about 2.4 million glomeruli in the both kidneys together. But here I will concentrate on the concept of one nephron and one glomerulus first. First we will see what is the structure of a glomerulus and then we will see how glomerulus functions as a filtration unit and what are the factors which alter the filtration through the glomerular structure, right? Let's come to the glomerular structure first, right? What is glomerulus? Let's suppose here I draw the afferent arteriole. What is this? This is afferent arteriole which is bringing the blood to filtration unit, right? Afferent arteriole is bringing the afferent arteriole is bringing the blood to the glomerulus. Now what really happens that this afferent arteriole will break down into multiple capillaries. It will break down into multiple capillaries. Let's suppose this is one capillary network. This is another capillary network. And here there is, let's suppose, right and let's suppose here is one more capillary network and this is like this now these all capillaries they rejoin each other and make what efferent arteriole what is it efferent arteriole so what we really see that there is There is afferent arteriole which is bringing the blood and afferent arteriole break down into bunch of capillaries. It break down into bunch of capillaries, right? And these anastomosing channels of capillaries, is that right? These anastomosing channels of capillaries are called, yes, they are called glomerular capillary tuft. Glomerular capillary tuft, right? Again, this is afferent arteriole, this is efferent arteriole, afferent arteriole breakdown. I have shown just three loops of capillaries, but actually it breaks down many, many loops of capillaries. And these capillaries are anastomosing channels. And these channels eventually unite together and make which arteriole? Efferent arteriole. So we can say, and this bunch of capillary together is called glomerular capillary tuft. What we call it? This whole bunch of capillaries is called glomerular capillary tuft. Now, this glomerular capillary tuft is surrounded by or invested by a group of cells, double layer of cells, let's suppose this is a very special group of cells. These are epithelial cells. These are very specialized epithelial cells. Right? And these epithelial cells which have some foot processes and these foot processes are called podocytes. What are these called? These cells are called epithelial cells are called podocytes and these have foot processes. And these cells
right? These are called visceral epithelial cells. Which cells? Visceral epithelial cells. Visceral epithelial cells. And then they are connected with parietal epithelial cells. What is this? They are connected with, yes, another type of cells and these cells are called, these cells are called, yes please, parietal epithelial cells. And then these cells join together to next group of cells which are making proximal convoluted tubules. Right? This is these are the cells of proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule will study later. Right? Now what you really see that this is a loop of capillaries and anastomosing capillary channels and these anastomosing capillary channels are called glomerular capillary tuft and this group of capillaries is invested by a double layer of epithelium. They are covered by double layer of epithelium. One layer of epithelium is this which is called epithelial cells, visceral epithelial cells and other layer is this and this layer is called not visceral, this is called parietal epithelial cells, right? And hold this structure, hold this structure is called glomerulus. Hold this structure is called glomerulus. Glomerular, glomerulus consists of what structures? It consists of glomerular capillary tuft and it, which is invested by or in which covered by double layer of epithelial cells. Right? This double layer of epithelial cell make a capsule and this capsule is called Bowman's capsule. What is it called? Bowman's, Bowman's capsule. Another important point which I want to mention that there are special type of cells in between these capillaries and these cells are called I will just highlight these capillaries a little more. Now, what do you really see? This is a bunch of capillaries. Now all these capillaries on one side they are having epithelial cells, right other side they are having special type of uh, these cells and these blue cells are called mesangial cells. What are the name of these cells? These are called, yes please, mesangial cells. And mesangial cells also produce lot of connective tissue. They also produce lot of connective tissue and I can show you that connective tissue in blue lines and this connective tissue right with them including the mesangial cell and this connective tissue together right this is the connective tissue right and along with mesangial cells right now, all this structure, this blue cells, mesangial cell with the connective tissue in which capillaries are in passing through, right? All this structure is called mesangium. What is the name of the structure? All this structure is called, yes please, mesangium. Now you should know when someone talk about glomerulus, you should know what is glomerulus. Glomerulus is a, yes, group of anastomosing capillaries present in the kidney 
invested by double layer of epithelial cells making Bowman capsule and capillaries are embedded within mesangium and whole glomerulus is functionally the filtration unit of the nephron. Whole glomerulus is functionally a filtration unit of the nephron where filtration occurs. Right? Now, I will go into detail of every part and one thing which is very important that between this the basement membrane of this capillary right and between this capillary endothelial lining and this epithelial lining here is a basement membrane what is it basement membrane on one side of this basement membrane there are endothelial cells of the capillary on other side of the basement membrane there are epithelial cells of the epithelial cells of the Bowman capsule right this black is what this is basement membrane and basement membrane is made of connective tissue on one side it has endothelial cells of the capillaries on other side basement membrane is having which cells visceral epithelial cells am I clear now in the next diagram to further explain the whole structure into detail let's suppose I will take this much area and enlarge it. I will just draw a next diagram basement membrane on one side capillary and mesangium other side epithelial cells. I will magnify this area and then we will discuss this structure into detail. Again whole glomerular capillary bed is fed by the afferent arteriole on other side there is drained by the efferent arteriole and because these capillaries are unusually placed between two arterioles. Most of other capillaries in the body have arteriole on one side and on other side they have venule. But these capillaries are unusual capillaries, glomerular capillaries that on the, they are fed by the arterioles as well as they are drained into arteriole. Due to that reason these capillary bunches very high pressure system. This is this capillaries are very high pressure capillary system because they are having arteriole which is feeding it as well as arteriole in which they drain. They don't drain into venule directly, they drain into another arteriole. Is that right? Of course, then this efferent arteriole will, if you really want to know, this efferent arteriole will eventually again break up into what? Capillaries. Efferent arteriole will again break up into capillaries and these capillaries are, these capillaries are near the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So, these capillaries are called peritubular capillaries. Right? These peritubular capillaries eventually drain into veins through which blood will go back out of kidney. Now, uh, we were discussing about that blood is coming to kidney and eventually it comes into afferent arteriole. Afferent arteriole break down into which capillaries? glomerular capillaries which are high pressure capillaries and they are concerned with filtration right and then blood is collected from the glomerular capillaries into efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole again break down into another group of capillaries which will drain eventually into venous system of the kidney to take the blood out of the kidney right. Now I am going to uh, en uh, enlarge this area you know glomerular basement membrane on one side there is capillary side, other side is the Bowman's side. So, I will enlarge this area and show you exactly what is the structure and function there. Let's suppose that here is glomerular basement membrane right on other side here should be what are what is this blood flowing side that is capillary side and to make it simple blood is coming from Yes, 
blood is coming from this direction. So which arteriole is this one? Afferent arteriole. This is one of the capillary and it is draining eventually into, yes, what is this? Efferent arteriole, right? Here we can produce a little dip to represent the cells over here and what is the what are these cells mesangial. yes mesangial cells and there is some mesangial connective tissue present over here right now this is our glomerular basement membrane and here are the cells what were these cells visceral or epithelial Visceral epithelial are visceral epithelial or parietal epithelial? Yeah, visceral epithelial. Right? And here is your Bowman's capsule space. Here is, of course, what are these cells? Yeah? parietal epithelial cells right now and yes it is draining into which type of cells what is this proximal convoluted tubular this is their brush border now First of all, I will talk in detail about endothelial cells. Endothelial cells which line the glomerular capillary is a very special type of endothelial cells. What is the very special thing about them? The endothelial cells which are present over here, they have thousands of the holes within the cell. They have thousands of the holes or perforations within the cell. Right? So, here are your endothelial cells. This is another endothelial cell and still here we have one more endothelial cell. Of course they are present on other side as well. Right? These are of course because this is a capillary it is lined by endothelial cells. But what is the very special thing about these endothelial cells? These endothelial cells have holes. They have Hold. And there are thousands of such holes, right, and such endothelial cells which have holes and perforation within the cell structure, we say that these cells are fenestrated. These cells are fenestrated. That is why this capillaries, this group of capillaries are called fenestrated capillaries. What kind of capillaries are these? These are called glomerular glomerular capillaries are called what type of capillaries fenestrated capillaries what is meant by the fenestrations fenestrations are the hole present within the endothelial cells lining the glomerular capillaries now what is the size of these holes these holes which are present over there right these fenestrations or holes which are present in these cells right their size is approximately 70 to 100 nanometer. What is the size of this hole? This hole is 70 to 100 nanometer. Right? Because this, this whole layer has to act as a filtration system, we should know that filtered material has to pass through these fenestrations. So what is the size of fenestrations? Every fenestration is somewhere between 70 to 100 nanometers. And every endothelial cell has thousands of fenestrations. Due to that reason, right, you can say these are perforated endothelial cells. What are these cells? These are unusual perforated endothelial cells. Of course, these perforations or fenestrations enhance the filtration process. Right? And average size is somewhere between 70 to 100 nanometer per fenestration. Is that right? Now, 
this was the speciality of what thing? Endothelial cell. Then when you look at the glomerular basement membrane under the electron microscope, you find that the central area is very very dense and this central area of the glomerular basement membrane which has on one side endothelial cell and other side it has what type of cells? Uh, uh, epithelial, visceral epithelial cells. So this central area which looks very dense under the electron microscope this is called lamina densa. What, what is this called? Yes please. Lamina densa. Is that right? And on both sides of this, the basement membrane looks less dense. Or we say that basement membrane in the central area is strongly electron dense. But on endothelial side and on epithelial side, basement membrane is relatively electron lucent. What is it? It is electron lucent means that under the electron microscope it looks less dense. It shows some lucency. Is that right? It's not as dense as it in the center. And due to this reason, this is you can say less dense area. And so we call it lamina rara. Uh, this was lamina densa. On both sides of lamina densa, there is lamina, yes please, rara. And this lamina rara, it is towards the capillaries. And this is called, the lamina rara, which is towards the capillary, this is called lamina rara interna. Interna. And this lamina rara, which is towards the Bowman capsule, or epithelial cells, this is called lamina rara externa externa so what we can say under the electron microscope the glomerular basement membrane right which is having endothelial cells on one side and epithelial cells on other side this glomerular basement membrane has centrally what thing lamina densa and on one side to the endothelial side it is having lamina rara interna and to the epithelial side it is having lamina rara externa. Is that right? Now let us go into bit detail of this structure. The how exactly glomerular basement membrane is made. Right? Actually glomerular basement membrane structure is primarily made of collagen type 4. Collagen type Four. Now this collagen, right, which made the suprastructure and basic network of glomerular basement membrane, uh, this collagen molecule consists of triple helix of alpha these are three peptide chains right these are called alpha peptide chains different type of alpha peptide chains they are making a triple helix and this triple helical structure is basically making what is this structure this is making collagen type 4 and this collagen type 4 is making the basic millions of collagen type 4 molecules are making the basic network structure of the glomerular basement membrane and this is very important to understand this part of these caps uh, peptide chains this part of the peptide chain is called globular globular non collagenous non collagenous component this is called globular non-collagenous component of the peptide. 
right or we call globular non collagenous domain this globular non collagenous domain of the collagen type 4 this green in some patient right there are there is formation of antibodies against this structure right there is formation of antibodies against the structure and these autoantibodies which react here right with the collagen which component of collagen globular globular non collagenous component of collagen type 4 in some patients there is formation of autoantibodies against this structure right and these autoantibodies may damage the glomerular basement membrane and there may be hematuria and proteinuria right and this is called this whole situation is called anti gbm gbm is glomerular basement membrane anti gbm antibodies these antibodies are called anti gbm anti bodies or we simply call it anti gbm glomerulonephritis anti gbm glomerulonephritis another important point which is really worth mentioning here is that similar antigens are present in alveolar basement membrane also similar antigens are present in alveolar basement membrane also so some patient may make antibodies which will react not only against the glomerular basement membrane in the kidney right antibodies will react not only against the and GBM but they will also react against the alveolar basement membrane under these circumstances in these patients where autoantibodies are coming out and attacking the kidney as well as attacking the lungs so this will produce hematuria here hematuria here and this will produce damage to this and that will bring hemoptysis here hemoptysis here right so when patient has hematuria and hemoptysis due to autoimmune disease in which there are antibodies directed against GBM as well as against ABM ABM is alveolar basement membrane GBM is glomerular basement membrane when both are destroy, destroyed by the immune process patient develop hematuria as well as hemoptysis do you think it's a good situation or bad situation yeah bad but I don't know why they call it good pasture syndrome rather than calling bad pasture syndrome they call it good have you heard of it yeah. okay good pastures syndrome we will discuss in detail when we will discuss the pathology of the good pastures syndrome that's when it affects both the kidney and the yeah that, that's why because sometimes these antibodies involve only kidney then we say there is anti gbm glomerulonephritis but if these antibodies damage the kidney as well as lungs and patient clinically comes with hematuria as well as hemoptysis we say patient is suffering with good pasture syndrome in which there is no good for the patient is that right anyway so this was something important that type 4 collagen is involved in the what is this glomerular basement membrane how do you remember that which collagen is making which component type 1 collagen is making which structure in the body yes Shireen will tell, tell me this at least you should know what type 1 collagen is doing where type 2 collagen is involved in the body where type 3 is involved where type 4 is involved type 1 ok should I tell you a trick to help to remember it yeah type 1 ok tell me what I have written here bone what is this so bone has type 1 collagen it's so simple in the spelling it's written that bone has which which collagen type 1 collagen okay tell me I'm going to write here something and you see what's wrong here
do you think these are the right spellings of cartilage so what i have written cartilage because cartilage has type 2 collagen is that right cartilage has type 2 collagen type 3 collagen is at many places so no need to remember right but type 4 4 sometimes you should do some poetry a little poetry here 4 under the under the floor how do you spell the floor double r four under the floor in type four collagen is under the floor what is under the floor basement so basement membranes wherever they are present in the body they are which collagen type four type four is under the floor four under the floor what is under the floor basement membrane basements so it is alveolar basement or it is glomerular basement or any other basement most of the basements a connective tissue basement membrane connective tissue that is having which collagen type 4 collagen is it difficult now so what do you think type 1 is present where uh, in bone and type 2 is present in cartilage <laughs> and 3 is present at many places and 4 under the floor and what is under the floor basement so 4 is present in the basement membranes another thing one thing we have talked about that these were which component yes please non non global non collagenous global globular non collagenous component of type 4 collagen against which antibodies may be formed if involve only kidney we call it anti gbm glomerulonephritis and if involve the kidney as well as lungs we call it goods pasture syndrome another important point which is related here is that sometimes there are mutations uh, and due to those mutations uh, these alpha chains which are supposed to make a good triple helix they are mutant if someone inherits defective genes and due to some defective genes he makes these alpha chains abnormal do you think then triple helix will be strong or weak it will be weak and this type of situation uh, will result into abnormally weak what glomerular basement membrane and these patients develop in early life hematuria and glomerular injury right and this is called hereditary nephritis that is called hereditary nephritis if you have mutations here and if these are mutant then naturally mutations of these uh, alpha chains they cannot mutant chains cannot make the proper triple helix and that will end up into yes hereditary nephritis right then another very important thing now you know that throughout this structure right type 4 collagen is present within the glomerular basement membrane right now another thing which I want to tell you which is very very important that this uh, type 4 collagen is making the suprastructure within, within the glomerular basement membrane and over this there is deposition of many many negatively charged molecules right what are those molecules which make the glomerular membrane very much electronegative right those molecules are like polyanionic polyanionic poly mean many anionic mean negative charges polyanionic proteoglycans there are lot of yes what are these here polyanionic what are these polyanionic proteoglycans and what is the charge on them they are electro negative these molecules are negatively charged the polyanionic polyanionic mean that proteoglycans have multiple negative charges so this suprastructure is loaded with lot of negatively charged molecules in which there are polyanionic 
proteoglycans. Moreover, there are laminins, they are fibronectin, they are antectin. You are not supposed to remember all of them. If you just remember this type 4 collagen and lot of deposition of uh, negatively charged molecule on them, so glomerular basement membrane will become electropositive or electronegative? Electro. It will be electronegative. So normally your whole glomerular basement membrane is electronegative. At the top, even there are special type of negatively charged molecules present not only in the glomerular basement membrane, but negatively charged molecules are also present on endothelial cells as well as epithelial cells. And those negatively charged molecules are as a group called sialoglycoproteins. Right? These are special glycoproteins which are present on the endothelial cells and make the layer electropositive or electronegative? They make it electronegative and they are present on epithelial cell as well. And epithelial cell surface also become electronegative. So what we really see that there is electronegativity within the glomerular basement membrane. There is also electronegativity, yes, present on the endothelial cell and there is also electronegativity present on epithelial cells. Is that right? So it means the whole filtration membrane is electropositive, neutral or electronegative? Electronegative. This is what you have to remember all your life as long as you are dealing the patient who have kidneys. So all our glomerular basement membranes are electronegative. They are overlying endothelial cells are negatively charged and uh, you can say that epithelial cells are also negatively charged. These are proteoglycans and glomerular basement membrane which make it negatively charged. The sialoglycoproteins also which are present on endothelial cells and epithelial cells, they also make it negatively charged. Why is this sialoglycoproteins? These, this negative charge is due to that protein. If you really want to see it, okay, I make it this beautiful. What is this protein? Sialoglycoprotein. And what are these charges? negative. So the millions of molecules like this present here as well as here. So whole this tri-layer, this is a triple layer for filtration. What are the three layers? One layer of endothelial cell, second layer of glomerular basement membrane, third layer of visceral epithelial cells. So all full, all the layers are negatively charged. Is that right? Once you have understood this, then another point about these epithelial cells. It's very important to know that these epithelial cells, when they are healthy, they are having foot processes. And with the tips of the foot processes, these cells are attached with the, what is this? Glomerular basement membrane, right? And these cells, right, they are having finger-like processes. And these finger-like processes not only help these cells to hold with the glomerular basement membrane, these finger-like processes interdigitate from one cell to the next cell. Let me tell you an example. Let's suppose this is one epithelial cell. This is the second epithelial cell, right? Now this is one epithelial cell, this is second epithelial cell, right? And let's suppose I should give me some paper. Okay, give me this. 5-6 paper, just hurry up. You can come here, come come here. Okay, give me two paper. I know you are very paper sensitive. Okay, yes. Now look, this paper is what? This is glomerular basement membrane. This is glomerular basement membrane. Under it, what is this applied? What is this my hand? Under it, this hand. The Bowman's capsule. No, no, no. This is not Bowman's capsule. Bowman's even it it is part of the Bowman's capsule but what is this visceral cell and what is this this is another visceral cell both cells interdigitate come here just take the basement membrane up let's really make the concept how this look this paper is the basement membrane take the basement membrane up yes don't take it away but just take it little up right now what is this 
above is the basement membrane, under it, this is one epithelial cell, this is the second epithelial cell, right? Now, just take it away. Now you see, these cells are having finger-like processes. One cell has a lot of finger-like processes, other cell also has a lot of finger-like processes. With the tips of the finger, these cells are held with the basement membrane. And these finger-like processes are interdigitating, you see here, interdigitating. And in between the interdigitation, you find there are longitudinal slits. You see the slits or not? Between one finger and, for example, this is one finger, this is the protocytes from one cell, digitation, this is from other cell. And there is one filtration slit here, there is another filtration slit here. These slits which are present in between the interdigitating foot processes of epithelial cells, these slits are called filtration slits. Now you should have a very clear concept that on this side, what is this? What is this? Fenestrations. And here there are space between two interdigitating area. What is this area? Filtration slit. What is this? Filtration slits. And what you have to see, what was the size of this point? Fenestration was 7200 nanometer. And this filtration slit, what is the size of it? 20 to 30 nanometer. It means the size barrier. For example, this is something which want to pass through this area down, right? The true barrier, size barrier is here because fenestrations are larger, but filtration slits are narrow. These are 7200 uh, nanometer, but filtration slits are 20 to 30. So they act as a distal size barrier. So molecules which are smaller, they can pass through it, but larger molecules will not be able to pass through this. Is that right? Another point which we have to remember is that these epithelial cells, right, with their foot processes, number one, you have to remember, these are visceral epithelial cells and this is parietal epithelial cell. Parietal epithelial cells do not have foot processes, but visceral epithelial cells have foot processes. Visceral epithelial cells are applied against the glomerular basement membrane. They are applied against the glomerular basement membrane. And interdigitating processes or foot processes of different epithelial cells interdigitate with each other. And in between the interdigitations, there are filtration slits. It means that basically fluid will filter to this area, to this area, to this area, to this area, and through that it will move laterally and then it will come from here or it will directly filter from here. Is that right? So fluid and substance will move through frustrated capillaries, then they will move through the network of type 4 collagen, right? through glomerular basement membrane and then fluid will move through or filtration, filtrating material will move through filtration slits. Let me recap that anything which is filtered from glomerular capillaries to the Bowman space, right, it moves through three layers. It has to pass through endothelial layer, it has to pass through connective tissue layer of glomerular basement membrane, it has to pass through the layer of visceral epithelial cell. Here to facilitate the filtration, what is present over here? Fenestrations. Here there is loose suprastructure of collagen type 4 having some proteoglycan molecules and some more molecules with that. And here there are filtration slits. Right? Any question here? Now, very recent concept is that these filtration slits are having filtration diaphragm. They are having a very thin diaphragm here and this is called which diaphragm? Filtration diaphragm, right? It's very thin. Now, this filtration diaphragm is made of special type of protein and that protein is called nephrine. That protein is called nephrine. In renal pathology, we will study that sometimes in some patients, nephrine is either mutant or against the nephrine antibodies are formed. And when nephrine is damaged, filtration diaphragms are destroyed. And uh, glomerular system start filtering out pathological amount of proteins, protein urea may start. That we will discuss later in glomerular pathology. Again, so what we really see that from here anything which has to be filtered, right, it has to be a large size of molecular weight or small size, small size because larger molecules cannot move. 
they have seen as you keep on increasing the molecular weight of a substance right the chances of that substance to filter are getting more or less they are becoming less the classical example is dextran dextran molecules can be dextran molecules can be synthesized with different sizes and with different yes and with different charges they have synthesized the dextran molecule with positive charges with neutral charges of course no charges and with the negative charges then they did the experiment that when uh, they infuse intravenously they pass dextran molecule of very small size they freely filter when they increase the size as they keep on increasing the size filtration will become less due to this reason they say that this glomerular filtration barrier is a size barrier it is a size barrier because filtration depend on the size of the molecule to be filtered smaller molecule like glucose or amino acids they freely filter but plasma proteins which are larger molecule they cannot filter is that right secondly they did another experiment that first they filtered they injected the person with the dextran molecule which could freely filter right then they made those molecules electropositive the filtration will increase or decrease if molecules to be filtered right if molecules to be filtered are having just right right sides to be filtered and at the top they are electropositive it means they are cationic molecule they will be repelled through the membrane or they will be facilitated in filtration they will be facilitated because membrane is negatively charged so any molecule which come here and which is positively charged will be attracted and move through that so they have seen that if there are three group of dextran molecules these are three groups of dextran molecule and all these have same molecular weight all three of them have same size and but one group is charged with positive charges other is neutral and third is synthesized and loaded with negative charges right this is the first group of dextran this is second group of dextran neutral dextran this is cationic dextran this is neutral dextran and this is anionic dextran what do you think out of this which will best filter Ex excellent you have given right answer the best filtration will be seen for cationic dextrans and which will be the worst filtered anionic it means that filtration not only depend on the size but also depends on the charge number one smaller size molecule will filter more larger size molecules will filter less number two that uh, cationic molecules will filter more and anionic molecules will be filtering less it means that anything which has to filter through this that finds two type of barrier one is the size barrier another is charge barrier that is why we say that glomerular kippel rays act as size and charge barrier system for the filtration now let me give you very classical example which you have to remember actually you know there are rbcs wbcs and platelets present over here rbcs are very large what is the size of rbcs 7 to 8 micron what is the size of on, of on average wbc yes please it is 12 to 14 micron right and what is the size of platelet what is the size of platelet 1 to 2 micron all these right okay this is the platelet all these platelet rbc and wbc they are so large that in a healthy glomerular capillary system none of them can filter it means when blood is passing through this filtration unit in a healthy system rbcs wbcs and platelets cannot filter due to their very large size 
they are prevented from filtration due to their size barrier system. Am I clear? Then plasma freely, many th most of the things which are present in plasma they freely filter but in a healthy glomerular membrane system, filtration system, plasma proteins do not filter. Why? What are plasma proteins? There are albumins, there are globulins and there are fibrinogen. Albumins are the smallest plasma proteins, globulins are larger and fibrinogen are very large. Is that right? Actually, they have seen the size of the albumin, size of the albumin molecule is just right to be filtered. That is just right that it can just plug and move through the fenestrations as well as type 4 collagen as well as through filtration slits. I am talking about which plasma protein? Albumin. Albumin. Globulins and fibrinogens are really too large to be filtered. But normally it is seen in a healthy person even albumin which can, which can easily pass due to its size still it does not filter. What could be the reason for that? Yeah, that albumin is negatively charged. All plasma proteins are at body pH, plasma proteins are negatively charged. And albumin is also negatively charged because albumin is negatively charged. So in spite of the fact that the size of the albumin is just enough to pass through the, this barrier, but still normally albumin does not filter in any significant amount practically we can say it does not filter at all through the healthy glomerular capillary system because it is negatively charged and negative charges of endothelial cells, glomerular basement membrane and epithelial cells they repel you can say albumin molecules and don't allow the albumin to be filtered. Now this information is very important. Why? Because there is a disease called minimal change glomerulopathy. Have you heard of it? We'll study again in detail in pathology minimal change glomerulopathy. Why we call it minimal change? In this disease, there is very little alteration in the glomeruli. Rather, un under light microscope, in this disease, you don't see any change in the glomeruli. Under electron microscope, you just find that in this disease, these cells are little bit disrupted and they are little bit swollen and lost their foot processes. So there is minimal change or almost don't find any significant change in glomeruli, but in this change, there is very heavy protein urea lot of albumin is leaking into urine, lot of albumin is leaking into urine. So doctors were always thinking what is happening, A endothelial cells look normal, glomerular basement membrane under the microscope look normal and under light microscope even epithelial cells also look normal, they show some abnormalities under electron microscope. So doctors were always wondering when this filtration system looks normal under light microscope why so much albumin is leaking down? Now they know the reason. Actually in this disease, some cytokines are produced in the body and those cytokines or inflammatory product, they neutralize the negative charges on this membrane. That's the only change. What really happens? In minimal change glomerulonephritis or glomerulopathy, right, there's some immunological products in the body which neutralize the negative charges of the glomerular filtration system and because these endothelial cells or GBM, GBM stands for glomerular basement membrane and epithelial cells they are no more electronegative. So they do not repel the albumin due to charge and as I told you albumin size is just the right size to pass through this different size barriers. So because electronegativity of filtration membrane is lost, so albumin is no more repelled due to its charge and albumin freely filters and patient develops heavy albumin urea. Patient develops heavy 
albumin judea. So I hope this is clear how this membrane is made and uh, how there is size and charge barrier, right? Then few words about mesangial cells. Mesangial cells are active players. They are not just cells sleep, like sleeping dogs. They are functional cells. And some disease processes, they start behaving in a pathological fashion and produce troubles for us. That is why we should know about the mesangial cell. Mesangial cells have special properties. Number one, they are contractile cells. They can contract. And if they can contract and they are present around the capillaries, it means they can have some influence on glomerular filtration. Right? And you will be surprised to know that mesangial cells have receptors for angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 2 can act on the mesangial cell and through that to some extent it can influence the filtration. So number one, mesangial cells can contract. Number two, mesangial cells can phagocytose. They act as phagocytic cells so that if there are some antigen antibody complexes here, these cells can engulf them. Right? Number three, mesangial cell can proliferate also. Later on, when we will discuss the glomerular diseases, we will find that in some glomerular diseases, mesangial cell too much proliferate. And of course, if they proliferate too much and produce extra amount of connective tissue, then of course they will compress the capillaries and glomerular filtration will be disrupted. Am I clear? So these cells can contract, these cells can phagocytose, these cells can proliferate and these cells can deposit mesangium including collagen and, and in the end, mesangial cells, if they are irritated due to some disease process, then mesangial cell can produce many biologically active product, right? Which can enhance the inflammation within the glomeruli. Is that right? But these things we will discuss in detail in renal pathology and glomerular diseases, right? Now, having said all of this, about the glomerular structure, right? Do you have any question about the glomerular structure? Right? After the break, then we will discuss about the glomerular function. That how the filtration occurs through glomeruli. What are the factors which alter the and affect the glomerular filtration rate, GFR, right? That we will discuss in the next session.